welcome back to Community Matters. I'm here with Rabbi Itchel Krasinchansky. He's a rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii, and we'd love to have him down, talk about religious things and holidays and festivals and celebrations and, and all about the Jewish people in Hawaii and elsewhere. It's an education every time, Rabbi. Thank you so much for coming down. Jay, thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure. Well, the big deal now is we're in September. Um, we're proceeding rapidly with alacrity, I would say, to the high holidays. And uh, we, we talked about that last time, a couple weeks ago, and we, didn't, we couldn't possibly have finished it because, uh, yeah, why don't you clip that back on? Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we, we uh, talked about it last time, and I want to talk about it some more, drill down maybe a little bit on, uh, on how we celebrate it. I remember my own experience um, at uh, Regal Park Jewish Center in the 50s. I was by mitzvah in 1955, yeah. mm -hmm. um, in the 50s, and um, let me tell you, everybody in the community was there. The place was just teeming with people. They were falling out the doors. They spent the whole day, spent two days on Rosh Hashanah, uh, hanging around the temple and just, you know, and davening, and davening, that means praying, uh, davening and davening all day long. It was um, for sure the most well-attended services in the whole year. Is this the same everywhere? Well, it depends. You know, you do have what they call three-day-a-year Jews, Rosh Hashanah, two days Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, those Jews who uh, make sure to show up in shul for, those high, for the high holy days. You have uh, Jews who are uh, Shabbos Jews. They show up every Saturday at synagogue. And then you have uh, everyday Jews, Jews who come to synagogue every day to pray. Uh, but it's interesting that in Judaism, the synagogue is not the central focal point of, of Jewish life. The home is. And something very, very interesting uh, on the more philosophical note, and that is that in Hebrew, there is no word, genuine Hebrew, for religion. Mm. Let's take a short break. Uh, we got a technical break we should take, Rabbi. We're going to be right back. You'll see. A really short one. Okay? Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, problem solved, Rabbi Itchel Kresenjansky, talking about the high holidays today, more on the high holidays, we started already last time. Um, and you were saying that there was no word in Hebrew for the word religion in English. Yeah? Correct. What's that about? Because the whole uh, concept of religion is actually very alien to Jewish thinking. Religion and religious is uh, you know, Latin words that come from Latin. And they, um, they, they represent the idea that um, at certain times and in certain places, you um, step out of your, of your life and you encounter God, uh, in whatever form. In Judaism, uh, we serve God 24-7. Everything that we do, <clears throat> whether it's praying, whether it's eating, sleeping, engaging in work, is also connected to our relationship with God. So are you telling me that I don't have to go to temple? That I can be connected to God, I can have a relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship, a beautiful relationship, a nourishing relationship, a sustaining relationship without going to temple? The answer is 
Yes and no. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, it would be equivalent of, say, of someone saying I'm a die-hard Republican but never shows up to Republican uh, <laughs> events. There's a lot of them like that. <laughs> One's personal relationship with God is uh, independent of going to synagogue or irrespective of going to synagogue or not. But uh, it is part of the Jewish way when you pray, you pray with other, with other co-religionists, with other Jewish people. There are certain prayers that can only be said in the minyan, which is a quorum of ten men. For that reason, we go to shul. But uh, we go to shul primarily to talk to God through prayer. But we communicate with God uh, every moment of our waking lives and even when we sleep. And that's the, so the, for Jew, in the Jewish idea, Judaism is a way of life. It's not a religion, something which is part of your life. It's not compartmentalized, you know, on, for Saturday or, or, or times like that. It, it, uh, it, this unique relationship that we cultivate with Hashem, with God, is something that manifests itself in everything that we do. That's, very, that's, very, that's very helpful, actually. Because, I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, people, they don't go to temple. Uh, for who knows what reason. It could be any distance. It could be they don't like the rabbi. They don't like the, some of the parishioners. Uh, they'd rather not be involved in whatever politics there are in the temple. Uh, they don't want to be asked for money, you know. Who knows what? And I think it's really interesting to, to, to look at it that way. That the first order of business is your personal relationship with God. Uh, but I want I want to go into the nature of the service on uh, Rosh Hashanah, especially because I remember you know there were some really very de devoted prayer people who would pray the whole day long. They would go through the prayer book you know from cover to cover. They would read everything and they would read it loud. Some of them, uh, and they were very good at reading Hebrew. And I could read the Hebrew, Rabbi. But I didn't know most of what. It was saying, and I'm sure I was in the majority, because right. the Hebrew was the liturgy. You like hearing it; and it has great liturgical music to it. Um, you don't mind uh, repeating it, but it's by memory or by association with the Hebrew characters. It is not by meaning. According to Jewish law, if a person's first language is not Hebrew, or if you don't understand Hebrew, uh, it's more appropriate to pray in the language you understand rather than the Hebrew. The only one prayer that we're obligated to say in Hebrew is the Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alakinu, Hashem Echad, which is on the tip of every Jewish. Why is that so important? Yes, I, of course, that's in every temple, every, every serious meeting of Jews. Why is because that so that important? Because that declares not only our faith in God, but also the nature of our faith in God, and that is when we say God is one, we don't just mean that there are no other gods, and we express our fidelity just to the one God. But uh, when we say God is one, we mean that all is God. God is a unifying being for every person and everything in creation. We're all part of this harmonious, uh, unifying uh, reality, and that's one of the cornerstones of Jewish faith. Well, isn't it you know, historically? I mean, leaving leaving Egypt and all that, there were it was an issue with Moses, wasn't it? Uh, are we going to have many gods here? Are we going to we going to worship um, idols, or are we going to worship the one the one God, which is who is not an idol? Well, and and so when you say God is one, you're saying forget the idols. Let's just talk about. You know, God as we now know God, that is, as the Jews now know God, um, that, that it's, it's, a, it's a person, it's a being up there somewhere. It, it's it's yes. saying that. Yes, and uh, today, you know, uh, worshiping idols is almost non-existent, maybe in some cultures, but in the West, uh, you know, worshiping idols is, 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 uh, is a thing of the past. But there was a time when, there was this thing when people would worship the sun, worship the moon, the stars, the water, different gods. And uh, Judaism, beginning with Abraham, the first Jew, who introduced this 
idea of monotheism, I mean, the belief in one and only, only one God. But um, the truth is, as the rabbis point out, that in every generation, the form of idol worship changes. So, you know, today you may have people who worship money. And that's their God, meaning that, that they, they uh, profess their allegiance to and pursue that exclusively. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, one of the big, big sins that uh, the Jewish people committed uh, when Moses led them out of Egypt was in a very short order, they sinned with a golden calf. Uh, Moses left, to the mount, went on to the mountain, the Torah tells us, didn't come down on the 40th day as he told them he would, because <clears throat> they mistakenly counted the days. And so they immediately turned uh, to his brother Aaron, and they said, we need a God that will guide us. And uh, they created this golden calf. And this is the sin of the golden calf, which actually on Yom Kippur, which is 10 days after the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur is a day of atonement. That's when God forgave the Jewish people for this sin. So we look at that story and we say, oh my, how they messed up so terribly. How can they worship a golden calf? But uh, as someone once pointed out, we're actually, you know, we are very, very, very far off from even where the level that they were at. Because they were ready and actually parted with their gold to find a God to lead them. Today, people in a heartbeat would part with God to find the gold. <laughs> so who, <laughs> who's more lost? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, this is very interesting. I, I also, you know, so, so here we are, okay. and we have a temple full of people just off the chandeliers, just spilling out <laughs> into the street. Every, every Rosh Hashanah, uh, there were steps on, on Regal Park Jewish Center. By the way, I went back on Google Earth to look at it. I should have brought a picture in for you. It's still there, and it still has these steps and a wonderful big uh, design in front of it. It's a, it's a beautiful temple built today. Um, and people would sit on the steps, the kids would sit on the steps, and and all the men would, you know, be, you know, having conversations, and the women would be in the back because <laughs> they weren't supposed to be with the men. And uh, so, and then he would rotate. You know, after a while, they'd say, "Oh, I got to go back in now. I got to go back in and pray." So, what are, what are they praying? What are they praying all day long for two days like that? What is the substance of the prayer, whether it be in in Hebrew or or some other language? Okay, good question. And basically. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is, as we mentioned last week, uh, called the Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment. Uh, we're taught that on this day, which is the anniversary of the birth of man, Adam was created uh, the last day of creation, on the sixth day. And every year since, on the sixth day following creation, uh, is Rosh Hashanah, is the Jewish New Year. So the Jewish New Year is set on the birthday of man rather than the birthday of the world. And it is a day of judgment where God examines our uh, deeds and our good deeds, also uh, our shortcomings. And we are judged, uh, we are judged for, uh, for them. And implicit in this, uh, in this uh, teaching is the idea that we matter to God, that what we do does in fact matter, not only to our own personal uh, macro, uh, macro world and small world, but actually also cosmically, every action we do uh, matters uh, to God and also um, has a bearing on the on the standing of the world. So we um, own up to our actions and those uh, things that need to be corrected. Rosh Hashanah and the ten days of repentance that follow uh, is the time of the year when that's done. So we're talking about that. 
I mean, if I, if I looked at the prayer book and I translated it to English, I mean, of course, there's a lot of, um, you know, routine prayers. And I said, no prayer is routine, but, you Standard. know, I mean, we're prayers that you, re you repeat every Saturday, prayers that you, uh, you know, uh, repeat at every holiday. But there are some prayers that are specific to the new year. And, I, and what I get from what you say is that those prayers that are specific to the new year are prayers uh, of examination. Prayers of uh, reminding ourselves that it's all on the record. Everything we do is being observed and judged, and uh, we can't we can't uh, you know we distance gloss ourselves over it. from the reality. Yeah. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's important to remember that while it's on the record, we still have the ability to change the record, to rewrite the record. Ah. And that's what the uh, idea of the ten days of repentance. That's the idea of the ten days of repentance. Lovely. Uh, so uh, now there's a thing, um, and this happens every Saturday too, called the uh, the silent amida, uh, which is the silent prayer. And uh, I'm recalling now that in the silent prayer, you have a prayer to read, but you read it to yourself. Correct. And so the, the the temple, the congregation, is silent, not a sound. Correct. And everybody's reading this, and some people are able to read through it very quickly. Not me, but some people can. It's in Hebrew. Some people can read through it quickly. Other people. And they have time left over before the, you know, the service resumes. Other people, they never finish. <laughs> the service resumes before they finish. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what it is, the silent Amida. Um, are we supposed to be reading this and thinking about what we're reading? Or are we supposed to be thinking to ourselves, communing, as you were describing before, with God? Yeah, very good question. Um, <clears throat> in the Torah, the Bible, there's a story of Jacob, our forefather Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the third of the three patriarchs. So Jacob is running away from his brother, Esau. Esau wants to kill him. And as he's running away um, from his father's house, he, um, he goes to sleep at night and he has a dream. And in the dream is, is a ladder that's, um, that's um, planted on the, uh, on the ground, and it reaches to the heavens, and he saw uh, angels going up and coming down the ladder, the dream of Jacob's ladder. And the dream is a metaphor, and the, la the metaphor of the ladder is a metaphor for prayer, as our sages explain us. And the idea is the goal of prayer is to lift man up from the ground up so that he can... Uh, commune with God, and he can reach the heavens. And there are rungs on the ladder, and there are rungs in, in the prayers. So the earlier part of the prayers is basically like a warm-up, warm us up uh, to the, the most important moment, which is to stand before God and uh, silently uh, talk to God. And that's why it's called a silent prayer. What do you say? I'm sorry? What do you say? Oh, so in that prayer, there are, for, you know, in every day, the silent prayer is different. Every day there are, first we acknowledge God's presence and we give thanks to God for uh, all the blessings that he provides for us. And then there's also prayers in there that we turn to God and ask for the things that we need, health and prosperity and... But it's whatever you want. Uh, there is an... Uh, uh, I mean, you a, could pray for a new Rolex, too, there, you know, there, couldn't there, you? There is a place in the prayer where you could in, in, inject your own personal prayers. I think... Sure. Uh, <laughs> you want your family to be healthy? You want your business to succeed? You want to make friends with somebody maybe you're not so friendly with? Uh, you want to <coughs> achieve something, so you ask to achieve right. it? But on Rosh Hashanah, there are the, the silent prayer is tailored to... The, the day and the, and the significance of the day. One of the <clears throat> main themes of the prayer on Rosh Hashanah, besides for it being a day of judgment, is the story in the Torah where <clears throat> God tests Abraham, Abraham being the first Jew, the first of the patriarchs, and, the, and he tests him ten different times uh, throughout his life. And what Judaism teaches us that when God tests us, challenges us, uh, it's not uh, many people mistakenly uh, feel 
and they're being tested by God that is some form of a rejection, that God is rejecting them, uh, and therefore they're going through the difficulty or the crisis, what it may be. But the Torah teaches us, on the contrary, that it's an expression of God's love for us, and the testing us is really the means to bring out our inner strength. One of the tests, the final test that God puts Abraham through is where he calls on him to take his only son, Isaac, and to bring him up as a sacrifice uh, onto the, in the mountain for God. And, uh, and the Torah tells us, as we all know, that Abraham willingly um, was ready to bring up his son Isaac as a sacrifice, and Isaac uh, willingly went along. And then just a moment before uh, he was about to slaughter his son, uh, an angel came down from heaven and said to Abraham, don't, don't, don't kill your son, because this is all a test, and God now knows how God-fearing you are. So it says that Abraham, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw uh, a ram, and the horn of the ram was uh, stuck uh, in, the, in the thicket of the woods there. So uh, Abraham realized that this ram was to be sacrificed in place of Isaac. And that's what he did. And therefore, the main ritual that we do on Rosh Hashanah is we blow the shofar, we blow the horn, the, the ram's, ram's, horn. ram's horn. And so we, we recall this event, and we recall, most importantly, Abraham and Isaac's uh, willingness to surrender to God. And to, uh, oh, how interesting, yeah. And, and there, were, there were certain uh, sounds that you, you blow on right. the ram's horn. And our tekiya teruah. I remember those sounds. What do those sounds mean? So, um, tekiya is like a long winded sound, and terua and shwarm are the broken sounds. And as the sages explain, because the idea of the shofar uh, is the idea of repentance, we're crying out to God. That's why the shofar is not a sophisticated musical instrument, it's a very simple uh, instrument, because when we come to God, we don't come to Him. We don't hide behind any sophistication. We come as a child that comes to their parents and we ask God to provide, to, to embrace us and to bless us. And um, the sounds are sounds of crying, as a child crying before God, before their parents. Isaac crying, yeah. perhaps. Or all of us. All of us. Yeah. So that's the idea of the show for blowing on Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, and that's really an important part of the service. Yeah. That is the theme, the main theme of the service. And the show for blowing, as uh, it's explained, not only is blown because to commemorate the story of Isaac and the sacrifice, but it's also, it was a, in days of old when they would crown a king, uh, they would blow the trumpet. And that, was, uh, that would herald you know, the, the king is now, you know, sovereign. And on Rosh Hashanah, we, uh, so to speak, crown God as king of the world. We re-acknowledge and reaffirm our uh, understanding that God is king of the world. What is, a, what is a king? A king, today we don't have in our government structure kings. There are no more kings. In the countries that have kings, they're ceremonial name only, but there was a time in, 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 in world history there were kings, and kings had absolute authority. Uh, they didn't have to go to Congress, they didn't have to get <laughs> voted. Whatever the king decreed is what happened. Oh, for the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, 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 we recognize God as king of the world, and the blowing of the chauffeur uh, heralds that uh, recognition. And when we say God is king of the world, it's easy to acknowledge that if we're only thinking about the big, wide world out there. But it's more important, as the sages point out, to uh, contemplate and to meditate how God is the king in your world, in your own personal life, in your own personal world. So uh, on, I guess the Rosh Hashanah will start uh, later this month um, on, on the sundown before the day of Rosh Hashanah, uh, and then it will end on the sundown two days later. Correct. A 48-hour period. Correct. Correct. Um, and, and in there, there's, 
There's no fasting as there is later on Yom Kippur, 10 Correct. days later. Right. But in fact, there's celebration with food. Correct. So both of those, in fact, all three of those nights are, are, are a feast of one kind or another. Correct, correct. And uh, we greet each other and we say that may we all be written and inscribed in the Book of Life, because as the sages tell us that uh, uh, God and His uh, heavenly throne, and we all, one of the prayers, one of the most beautiful prayers on Rosh Hashanah is, uh, describes how every single being passes before God uh, on this very day, and it is decreed whether this person will live or die, whether this person will uh, be healthy or not. Everything about our life that we think is in our hands, we, uh, we recognize that it's not in our hands. We're so all in God's we're, hands. We're looking forward into the new year. Exactly. And we want to be inscribed in the Book of Life because that means we'll be alive in the new year. We'll, right. we'll make it to the next Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Yes. And the Book of Life is just uh, it's a, the notion Metaphor, of, uh, yeah. of living for the next right. year. What, what is the prayer? Can you give me the Hebrew in that prayer? Sure. Um, and it's a fascinating story. It's a prayer in Hebrew is called Unasana Taikif Dushas Hayem, and, uh, which, is, which means let us declare the awesomeness of this day. And it says, Bereish Hashanah Yikosevun, on Rosh Hashanah it is written, Yom Kippur Yechosevun, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. Who will live and who will die? How many will be born and how many will pass on? Mm. All of the things in those prayers. Mm. And as we end there, that uh, like a shepherd who counts his sheep, the same way God uh, has everyone passes, we pass through God. And the very final line is, however, shuva, which is repentance, phila is prayer, with tzedakah and charity, charity. Mavirin Esroya Akzeda have the power to annul any decree. So ultimately it's in our hand because when we turn to God in a genuine resolution to do good and to be better, so then uh, that repentance and that uh, cleanses our slate, so to speak. Well, it seems to me that um, if you know this, as a Jewish person or a member of a Jewish family, if you know this, you will go down to temple on Rosh Hashanah because you need that. And you need to be inscribed in the Book of Life. And uh, yeah, I suppose you could be inscribed in the Book of Life if you didn't go, but it's probably a smarter idea to go down there and, um, and, 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 and try to you know, see into the future and maybe, maybe it'll help your odds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being inscribed in the Book of Life. Yeah. Right, and what's, what's most interesting is that even though, like you say, it's a celebration, it's a holiday, but it's a very, it, it has very serious elements to it. And that's the way Jewish people celebrate the New Year. It's not just fun and games and party, but it is, first and foremost, a very, you know, very holy day. Very also, important. Also and, you know, we have to keep this tradition up, don't we? We have to make sure the generations to follow know about Rosh Hashanah, celebrate right. Rosh Hashanah, right. commune with God, commune with, uh, you know, their lives and the future and the book of life. So interesting to hear about this. Thank you so um, much, Rabbi. One last thing before we, we conclude sure. is that it's customary on Rosh Hashanah, we, everything we eat, we dip into honey. Oh, yeah. And there's even lekach, which is honey cake, which is traditional to be eaten on Rosh Hashanah. And then we even say a prayer, may this year be a year of sweetness. Sweetness. A sweet year, a good year and a sweet year. And it wouldn't hurt to have a little bit of Slivovitz <laughs> alongside. <laughs> Slivovitz is a, what, a Polish kind of vodka kind of thing. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. Great to Always see you a again. pleasure. Always a pleasure. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. And everyone is invited to come join us at Chabad, Rosh Hashanah. Thank you so much. Maybe we can do one more time before Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Because yeah, Rosh Hashanah is in. Uh, is uh, two and a half weeks, maybe in like maybe. Okay, we'll have another, we'll yeah. have another talk, we'll, yeah. and we'll include Yom Kippur. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Yeah, yeah, yeah.